infectious disease specialist. And from the time I retrieved my training, I've been fascinated by a strange fact. For most people who die of infection, it's not the microbe itself that kills them. Rather, it's their immune system that reacts to fight the microbe with inflammation, and that irreversibly damages their organs. And this paradoxical reaction of the body is called sepsis and affects 750,000 Americans every year and kills about a quarter to a third of them. And if we could find a treatment for sepsis, in one move, we'd have a treatment, life-saving treatment, for all of these infections combined. Now, about 10 years ago, in the course of researching how to combat sepsis, I started thinking about another paradox. And that's the test platform that we use to study sepsis. Now, these are the people, or soon will be the people, um, that get sepsis. All kinds of people. And these are the animal models, the test system that we use to study them. Mice. And so there are many reasons we've come to use to study mice as animal models. They're small, they don't cost very much, we can manipulate their genetic material with tremendous ease. But there are two main problems with studying mice, to, to using mice to study inflammation. The first one, illustrated here, is that all the mice look the same because we use inbred mice, and inbred mice have the same genetic background, so they don't appropriately capture the beautiful variation we have in people. The second problem is more fundamental. Mice are resistant to infection and inflammation. Models injecting large amounts of bacteria or purified endotoxin, purified material from bacterial walls called endotoxin, uh, into the mice end up not reproducing the disease that we see in the mouse and in, in people. Endotoxin is one of the most inflammatory substances known. And when we inject large amounts of either endotoxin or bacteria into the mice, the disease is different. The mice eventually keel over and die, whereas in people, it's a slow disease that takes place over weeks and are characterized by organ failure. Now, in 2003, I went on sabbatical to the Institute Pasteur in Paris. And the goal of the year was to think about a better way to study sepsis in humans. And during the year, I read everything I could about what had been done previously for models of inflammation. And I realized that it was possible to assemble a list, a table, of the sensitivities of different vertebrate species to injection with endotoxin. I found that there was about a hundred million fold difference in sensitivity between the vertebrate species and humans are at the extreme end of a, sen of a sensitivity scale, down at the bottom of the table. Mice fall in the middle of a table at about 1,000 to 100,000-fold more resistant than humans. And ideally, I guess, the sensitivity of an animal model to reflect humans would be the same. Now, soon after I returned to my laboratory in Boston, I was honored to join a group of scientists studying human host responses to a, in a part of a 10-year NIH-funded consortium of investigators from multiple centers in the United States. This was funded by a new grant mechanism, a glue grant, it was called, whose goal it was to glue together small investigators like myself into a large group of scientists to address large uh, scientific problems. And the main goal of this uh, grant project was to use emerging technology to study gene responses across uh, the entire genome in the immune blood cells of patients with different inflammatory diseases. The diseases we studied were trauma and burns and injection of a tiny amount of endotoxin into human volunteers, so small that it wouldn't hurt them. And mostly we studied human responses, but we also studied the, the same gene responses in mouse models designed to mimic these diseases. And this result as Alyssa mentioned, it was published several months ago and have become extremely controversial because we found that there was an extremely poor correlation between what we found in the mouse models, the gene responses in the mouse models, to the diseases we were studying. Now, this is a figure of one of, one of the figures out of this paper, and the blue box outlines um, the correlation of two of the human conditions, uh, human trauma and burn trauma. And you can see it's a diagonal line which indicates a good correlation. However, in the red boxes, you can see 
the gene responses of the mouse model is designed to mimic them, and as you can see, it looks more like a cloud than a diagonal line, indicating very poor correlation, almost random, in fact. Now, initially, this seems surprising, especially given the worldwide use of animal models. However, after some reflection, this seemed less surprising to me. If, after all, humans don't look much like mice, and in fact, if through evolution we've studied each of our traits through natural selection, why would we necessarily assume that their innate immune systems would look the same either? Mice have lived for millions of years in environments that are teeming with microbes, and they have large litter sizes and short gestational ages, both factors which would increase the number of, of uh, evolutionary cycles that it would take to adapt. And so it seems like mice have evolved a different and maybe even a better strategy of dealing with infection by tolerating larger doses of microbes without inducing the same overwhelming infect, uh, inflammation that we see in people. Well, what are the implications of the data that we generated? Mice are at the center of a critical path that takes drugs from a test tube where it's discovered for a target all the way to human trials. And groups sitting around the world in small lab uh, meetings like my own, or in small pharma or large pharma or funding agencies or regulatory agencies all use this data to decide whether to take a drug forward. And so if a drug doesn't work in a mouse model, it never progresses to humans, even though there's a reasonable chance that some of these might work in humans. And conversely, all of the drugs that have been studied in mice that have worked have failed in humans. So do our data extend to other diseases? What about atherosclerosis or cancer or Alzheimer's disease, all of which have some component of inflammation? And our data don't touch on these diseases, so we really can't comment. I think that will need to be done by the investigators who study each of these diseases. Nor do our data mean that we should stop using mice as models. Mice have been extraordinarily useful in studying specific genes or gene pathways, as well as toxicities in the development of new techniques. But it does seem to me, at least, that extrapolation from the mouse models all the way to a complicated human inflammatory disease might be overreaching. Well, where should we go next? Where is the path of excellence forward? And this is a complicated question. I don't know the answer to that. I would hope that our data would, would spark some scientific discussion, uh, as I think it has, as to how to properly interpret mouse models in human disease and rather than stopping work with mouse models, one way forward might be for the scientific community to raise the bar and to ask that if someone is promoting a particular gene or pathway, that it should be justified to move at least in the same direction in humans as it does in mice. This at least seems reasonable to me. And there is one other aspect that seems worthy of consideration. The current approach assumes, in fact, it critically depends on considering animals and, uh, well, humans and mice to respond the same, but our data suggests otherwise. In fact, the mice seem to have evolved in a better way to tolerate high microbial lobes without, loads without inducing the same the inflammation that's so damaging in humans. So perhaps rather than considering the two species to be the same, maybe it would be better to embrace their differences and to study and learn from the species' differences. Perhaps we're looking at it backwards. Instead of trying to use mice to model human diseases, perhaps we should be trying to model humans on the success of the mice. Such a concept isn't impossible to imagine someday through reprogramming of immune cells. Maybe one day in the future, a patient will come into the intensive care unit with a serious infection, and we'll be given a treatment to transiently render the patient to be more like a mouse. Thank you.